Hello and welcome to the Tech Lunch Podcast, where we encourage our listeners to learn something new about tech every week. This can range from learning about new and exciting te- applications to the advancements in coding and technology. If you are always learning, you will always be a step above the rest. Take the time during lunch or during a break to listen and learn, kind of like a lunch and learn, but for the years. This podcast will open the listeners' ears to new and exciting technologies they may have not been purviewed to in the past. These topics will range from manufacturing technologies to data collection technologies and everything in between. Hello, I'm Nick. Hello, I'm Ed. And this week, we're going to kind of talk about requirements gathering. And, you know, requirements gathering is is one of those things that you have to have and have to know to be able to build adequate systems or set up adequate equipment based on user needs or facility needs or anything for that matter. And, you know, there's a couple of tricks to the trade when you're trying to do um, requirements gathering, but we'll kind of touch on those in a second. So, you know, Ed, from an OT standpoint, or from a non-IT standpoint, I should say, you know, when you when I when you hear requirements gathering, what kind of bells start ringing? So, from my point of view, it's uh, going to be based off of an automation c- controls uh, change, or what we call an automation change request. Uh, so production approaches the uh, controls engineer and says, "Hey, I have an I- we have an ideal. We want the uh, equipment to work this way because it'll help with the process and it'll cut off three seconds, which will make us more efficient." So the first thing the controls guy is going to say, "Well, why? What is the reason for the change? Explain to me what are we changing in the process." and explain to me why we need the changes in the process, and explain to me what is the impact of changing this in the process. Makes sense. Will, will this cause another problem? And that's what I think about the first step when we're talking about uh, requirement gathering. Yeah, you know, and that's something that, you know, if you think about it, you're starting to get into, you know, the ACR process is, is kind of like the, you know, IT requirements gathering when it comes down to building a system. And how I look at it personally is I do the five W's and an H. You know, when I when I when I say five W's and an H, I'm talking about the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. You know, I'm I'm starting to think about those major things. And you know, it's like who who am I building this for? And you know, it's like then you get into the what is what am I building? You know, what process am I building this for? And how is it going to impact that process? And then it's like, the, you know, you go from the who, the what, the when, you know, you start talking about, you know, dates and stuff like that when you want something done. And you start getting to the why, you know, why am I building this? You know, the who, what, when, where, why. Um, uh, and then you start really start building into that, you know, and you start getting to the how, you know, how am I going to build this? You know, how is it going to be there? You start breaking all this stuff down, the who, the what, the when, the why, the where. And, you know, the where is, you know, is it going to be a virtual machine? Is it going to be a standalone PC? Or what is it going to be? And then the how is, you know, how it's put together, you know, the grand scheme of things. You know, but we take that, that same process, kind of like the ACR process, and kind of break it down a little bit further. Then you start getting into what's called a requirements traceability matrix um, or an RTM. Um, requirements traceability matrix, they're kind of not used in every industry, but in most industries, they're starting to become more prevalent. Um, I'm not sure if y'all use you know, IBM Rationale doors or not, or a rationale system that kind of maps all that together. And, you know, what I mean by that is it's a system that does your requirements traceability. Like, for example, if I have, say, Microsoft Word, I must have, and it, you know, it says the system shall provide a system that allows for um, documents to be processed, documentation processing system, which is going to be requirement 1.00. 
And then it says the system shall allow the user to input text. That's 1.01. And you start breaking down the system by functionality. And then once you start getting into like system testing, which we'll get into later, you test back to those requirements. And then you know that you're, the, the gathering you've done is actually correct. And from a OT point of view, we would use use case diagrams. And basically with the use case diagrams, we would try to dr drill down to that detail or those details that would give us as humanly possible, as many possibilities that we could, uh, or scenarios that we could plan for. Um, this is probably more of a high level view. Um, we would use this uh, almost like a blueprint. But the, the big thing about using the use case diagram, now we can start to uh, put some of these scenarios in play and then we could uh, use virtual machines and uh, with the virtual machines, we could do some simulations to see mm -hmm. what would actually happen when we put in certain inputs. Uh, we could also use fuzzing, where we just randomly put in all types of inputs to see if we could break the system. So these are things that you would do from an OT side to see if the system is stable enough or if some user or a user could do something that would uh, collapse your system. Yeah. Which sounds oddly familiar like software testing. And which pretty much is, you know, it all goes back to the same, you know, break fix, you know, mentality of where, you know, I'm going through like a sprint or something like that. And I'm testing something, trying to break it and then pushing it back to my developers to improve upon the process. And that kind of goes back to, you know, what is one of your main requirements? Your main requirements must be 100 percent system uptime. You know, that is a the glorified um, uh, requirement that. You know, you could probably agree with me that is everywhere. You'll never find somebody says, you know what, I'll, I'll take 50%. You know, or I'll take 10%. You know, you, you, know, you never get somebody in their, in, their, in their mind that says, hey, guess what, I'm going to take less than 100% system uptime. Never. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just how it goes. So, I mean, so the next step for us is we want to remove any language ambiguity. We want to make sure that production is talking the same language that the uh, maintenance or uh, controls engineer is talking. We want to make sure when they say, hey, we want this widget, that we understand what they're talking about. We want to uh, break it down into basic language so they get what they're asking for. We don't want to give them something that they're not satisfied with. Why create something and then six months later, well, that's not what we wanted. We wanted something different. So you want to you wanted to lay the groundwork in this in this step and uh, pull out that information or decipher what they actually want. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means you have to translate something from a production side to an engineering side. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, you know, on the IT side, we kind of look at that as, you know, interface definitions. And also, you know, making sure that it's clear, concise, um, ready to be used, um, Available to the lowest lo lowest common denominator. Pretty much, you're taking and building your systems from a GUI standpoint with a requirement that says, hey, guess what? I need this readable, usable, and downright simple to use. You know, it must have less training put into it to be able to understand how to use it. Um, you know, the system use case or system landscape of how to use something has been the big has been another one of the biggest requirements you'll ever see. You know, it's it, it's a theory of keeping it Barney style. You know, keeping it as easy as it can to be and understand that you know anybody can figure it out. And when we're talking Barney, we are talking the big purple dinosaur. Um, so you know that's how we look at it. So from uh, another aspect in that second stage. Uh, we want to get a whiteboard. We want to do a flow chart. We want to break down a step-by-step -step of what this process is going to look at, look like. That way we can uh, get from the, the end user or get from or pull from the uh, people actually using this uh, system what they want. So you draw out step-by-step -step and we look at the flow of work. And by doing that, 
we start to understand. We do planning and management, and then, oh, wait a minute. Hey, uh, that's not what we meant. Good. So we know that step four is not what you meant. Let's go back to step three, and let's figure out what it is you need after step three. So these are some other things you would do in that second stage. Mm -hmm. These are some things that a control engineer would do. You would have uh, meetings and sit down, and like Nick said, you have sprints. And we would try to figure out together as a team what we need to make the uh, plant uh, as efficient as it could be. Yeah, GUI optimization and you know um, uh, system specification at that point is what you're kind of dealing with. And you know from there, it is a lot of push and pull. You're never going to find a user that tells you exactly what they want the first time. You know, it's going to take you six or seven times to figure out what the user wants. We know that. I think anybody who's worked in IT or OT understands that, you know, the user's going to tell you what they want. It's just not going to be the first time they ask. Um, and you're going to have to change it. You know, it's repetitive. You know, it's <clears throat> the opening the door to, you know, a continuous flow and also a continuous development life cycle. You know, is as things change, as people come in, things will move. You know, your management comes in, it's going to change five or six times before someone is happy with what they want. And that is, it's not a understatement. It's not a joke. It kind of is. But it's more or less like it's going to change based on the person. And that brings us to the third step of what a control engineer would look like. Look at. We would look at corner cases. So now in a corner case, we're going to say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we didn't expect for that to happen. There is a scenario where if you hit this button, and we happen to have a uh, safety fault. And if a, uh, a conveyor is transferring a unit from one conveyor to another conveyor, we can get into a lockout condition. So with the corner cases, what we can basically do is say, identify, oh, that's a bug. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't know that. We didn't know that existed because we never used that functionality. Now that we're using that functionality... We have uh, a problem. So once again, we would get together as a group and say, hey, we need to make some extra steps to guarantee or we need some extra steps to get greater clarification of how we can make this work and not have this bug. Because it doesn't happen all the time, but if the conditions are right, it can't happen. Yeah. Well, that's where the, that's where the, the software testing comes in. And, you know, we do, we have the same thing, you know, in IT, it's the same thing. It's the bug finding and bug bounties and all other, you know, fun things you hear people talking about. However, there are some people out there and some organizations out there that will build their system to a certain point that their bugs now become features. And which, what that means is the system's still broken and it's people now just expect it to happen. Um, most of this is, you know, coming from bigger industry and stuff like that. And some of the other operating system manufacturers out there that have found a way to make a system so buggy that's considered a feature. Um, however, we see that in the manufacturing realm of where things are broken just enough to be annoying. However, you learn to deal with it. You kind of expect it to happen. You know, am I saying that's right? No. Am I saying that's wrong? Yes. Don't do that. But the thing is, is adequate software testing proceeds and runs side by side with adequate, you know, requirements gathering. So if you don't gather your requirements correctly, you don't know what to test to. So if you miss step, say, 14 out of 28 steps, you're going to break step, you know, 14.1 because you missed the initial step. And it's just going to shatter it down the line and you're going to be going down a rabbit hole. And, you know, I know that happens in the OT standpoint where, oh, let me test this, but you forget to test B, but you test A, and now you're trying to test C, but you forgot B, and now C's broken. You know, is it a process problem? Not always. Is it a software issue? Not always. Sometimes a combination of both. So that's where we would use a functional decom <clears throat> decomposition diagram and basically, we would take the whole function of the project along with all the subtasks needed, subtasks needed to complete it, and we would start looking at those tasks. Uh, and then the other part of that is that, uh, as a control engineer, it's not—it's probably not common, 
but we probably need to look at using things like agile as opposed to waterfall techniques mm-hmm. where we test each piece of what we're doing and send it to the customer or the end user and the end user say, oh yeah, I like that. Yep, that's and, then, and then they send it back and say, oh, okay, can we get the next? So you basically send them nibbles. You send them nibbles of what you're doing until you get to a whole bite. Well, at least at that point you'd be releasing in nibbles. Yep. And so you'd give the user kind of, you know, piece by piece, piecemeal. You know, I guess that's, you know, and that's something we'll talk about in a later episode and stuff like that is, you know, agile versus waterfall methodology. But all that is is a development life cycle, you know, and also it can be an SDLC if you really look at it that way. But it's, you know, building in batches. You know, you're okay with a few bugs because your next release is going to fix it. However, if you're going to be months or years in between releases, you are now waterfall. If you're going to be, say, two weeks in between releases and it's going to be a rolling release, now you're agile. And, you know, that's something where the delineation kind of needs to take place. Because some people think they're agile and it takes two to three years to update a process. That's not very agile. You know, the definition of agile pretty much means that it's got to be, you know, quick and repetitive. So, you know, and that's just kind of how you look at it. You know, most times people think in a waterfall methodology. You know, waterfall mentality. And the same thing comes in requirements gathering. Because people forget to gather everything they need. They gather all these requirements ahead of time. And they want to build every single one of them. They want to test every single one of them. Split it up. And I think that might be the big key takeaway to that one. And then I would say the next step that a controls engineer on the OT side of the fence would uh, turn to we would create a user story. And with a user story, basically we're trying to get all the relevant information for our documentation requirements. And what this means is that maybe we don't create the perfect story, but we discuss what features we want to accomplish and how to align that between all groups. And with this, the software development team, in this case, it would be OT with the controls engineer. We would assist with the uh, creation of all the user stories with the end users. Because at the end of the day, the end user is the person that's day in and day out that's interacting with this system. And at the end of the day, we want to make money and uh, make the company profitable. That's for every company in the world. Yeah. So uh, that that would be our next um, step. And, you know, I think that's, you know, a, a, a one thing that, you know, IT and OT have in common is user story creation. You know, we, we may create them in a different step than OT does, but we still create them. Um, you know, and it's pretty much, you know, as a user, I want to do dot, 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 dot. As an admin, I want to do dot, 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 dot. I want, you know, and that's how you have to write them. You know, bait, and the thing is, is you can tie those user stores to your requirements. And so you can take all your requirements gathering and be like, okay, does this story match this requirement? If so, yes. If not, what does it match to? If it doesn't match to any of my requirements, why am I writing it? So the user stories must match to your requirements no matter how you look at it. It can't be, well, I needed to do this. Okay, you want it to do this, but you don't have a requirement for it. So does it need to do that? You're adding a new requirement? Or are you just giving me something new that you just thought about? You know, I want to stick to the the requirements at hand. But, you know, and that's something that, you know, if wanted... I guess you could say we can go over later about how to do user story creation and stuff like that and really get it out there for people because it is new. Well, not really, but it's new enough to, you know, most people, you know, how to create user stories, how to do requirements, gathering requirements, documentation, and also how to do like an RTM. And I would, I would follow up with what Nick's saying is if, if you plant seeds, you want crops. So, once we plant the seeds for these systems or once we implement these systems, we want to monitor these systems and see how accurate they are. We want to take those concepts we said in the past where we take uh, the Internet of Things and we take um, the SCADA systems and the MES systems, the ERP systems, and at the uh, actuator and sensor level, we put all that in a, uh, a namespace. And then we start using the MQTT 
to verify that what we did worked or mm -hmm. to pinpoint where we messed up because it should be a, a, a living document. It should be a, the project shouldn't stop when it's released. We should be able to show, Hey, this was successful and here where it's successful. I can show you the data. I can show you the percentages. I can show you how we reduced downtime. I can give you the OEE, how this made the company profitable. That's what we supposed to have. Any change that's made in a production environment with industrial control systems should always, one, should always be secure. Two, should always make the process better. And three, should always be profitable. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. You know, that's just something that, you know, from the IT side we look at also. And, but the other thing is, is, you know, it's for the IT and the OT side. The one thing we also have to look at is, are we building these systems for our health or are they actually being used? So, you know, what I mean by that, and like, you know, Ed was talking about, you know, logging and stuff like that and, you know, using a unified namespace to pull this stuff together, MQTT to monitor what's going on. However, it's also monitoring the user logs, you know. Every once in a while, when you build a brand new system, go ahead and pull the user logs. You know, see what's being used. See how it's being used. Um, and, you know, go from there. But also, when you've built a system, do a UAT on it. A, you know, user acceptance test. Have the users play with it a little bit. See if they find what they don't like. See if it's going to be used. Because, you know, you can spend days, months, years, you know, decades, you know, building a system and no one's ever going to use it. You know, they'll stare at it like it's, you know, going out of style and, well, then it never gets touched. You know, we've all been there, done that, seen them, that, you know, somebody spends all this time building the system and, you know, they go away and, you know, no time flat or they're barely used or heavily criticized. Looking at you, Microsoft. Um, but, you know, it just kind of really depends on, you know, how it goes. And, you know, it's just, it just really just depends on, you know, if the system is going to make the company money, it must be used in the process. And then, you know, at, at the end of the day, was the widget worth the, worth the risk? Right, exactly. Are we just making widgets or dashboards or KPIs just to make those? Or are those things actually tools? Those things should be things like a Swiss knife. We should be able to use each of those tools in a specific way to... Uh, do deep dives to make the line run as efficiently as it can and to also identify, hey, here's some steps we can get rid of. Right. Maybe, some, maybe there are steps that we did not need. Maybe there are a process that can be done in multiple places. Mm -hmm. So you should also be thinking in, the, in your mind mitigation. Yeah, what mitigation happens if right. something stops here? How can we mitigate this risk? How can we use... Uh, other processes can we do semi-automatic and make it work so those are things you all should to be doing when you're doing this uh requires gathering don't just do um a pipe that if or a string if i cut the string then i'm, I'm down right your your line or your company should be agile like we said before not a waterfall cut the water off you don't have any water to go over the waterfall exactly and, you know, the thing is, it's like, understand that, you know, asking for, you know, software and solutions and stuff like that, you need to use them. You know, don't, don't come to your IT department, your OT department, begging and pleading and wanting something and never use it. You know, it's, you know, we look at that stuff, you know, from at least my side and probably your side as well. If I've spent all my time building this piece of software or modifying this piece of equipment and now you don't use it. I'm now like not less likely to really lend a hand because I'm now seeing that my time is being wasted. You know, time is money, money is time. And the thing is, you know, the whole thing between you know slow and steady wins the race really isn't part of you know IT or OT methodology when it comes down to requirements gathering. It's we want to get it done as fast as possible so I can get to work and get you the solution that you want. But you know, if I don't have your requirements, then I don't have what you want. And I think that's the big ticket item and the, and the big key takeaway, what we're kind of getting at is 
understand your requirements, know how to give them, play with them, and write them down. For the love of God, write them down for somebody to read them. Because if you don't write them down, you're going to forget. And, you know, that's just one of those things that, you know, gathering your requirements ahead of time helps a project succeed in the later terms. And it also helps you find where the bugs are later on. If something breaks, you know when to go back and look at it and go, okay, well, I didn't know they were going to do this. So, you know, with that, you know, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ed for our uh, closing remarks. And, uh, you know, when, take a look at your, your requirements, figure out how to gather them, and, uh, you know, enjoy the process of getting there. You know, practice this. And, uh, you know, I'm going to leave it over to Ed, and hopefully he'll uh, give us a, a, a moment of, you know, imploring people to, to, you know, really learn this. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Like I said before, before we uh, approach any team about uh, some new functionality, we should really think about it, get on a whiteboard, write it out, uh, visually look at it, flow chart it. Um, and then you can get what you actually want. And, and we're not going to, you're not going to get everything right in the beginning. That's why you do testing. But uh, you should definitely have a plan before you just say, hey, let's put something in. And with that, uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate everybody uh, listening. And uh, if you have any suggestions, please uh, let us know. And uh, me and Nick, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Tech at Lunch podcast, where we hope you learned something about tech during your break or during your lunchtime. If you did, please give us a follow to prevent missing future episodes. If you have any ideas or something you want to hear or learn about, please send us a show idea to podcast at vulcanora.com. Hope you have a good rest of the day and continue learning.